go straight to the start of the reading then click here now and you can go there um i thought i'd do a little instruction it's been a long time since we've done shock of the fall i'm doing chapter three today and then my next video will be chapter four and five because they're both short chapters and i don't think it's worth doing two separate small videos um i'm also going to be putting a poll on my blog so you guys can decide what the next read through should be It'll, I will give you a selection of books and the most popular one or the one that gets the most votes for another week will be the one that I will read and I will possibly do the well the next highest like the second best I will do after I finish that one anyway I'll get on with this hope you enjoy it this is chapter 3 of the shock of the fall kicking and wailing I had no right to attend my brother's funeral but I did attend I wore a white polyester shirt that itched like mad around the collar and a black clip on tie. The church echoed whenever anyone coughed. And afterwards there were scones with cream and jam and that's all I can remember. But now I should slow down a bit. I tend to rush when I'm nervous. I do it when I'm speaking too, which is weird because you tend to think that it's just those small tightly wound men who speak quickly. I'm about six feet tall and might even still be growing. I'm 19 so maybe not. I'm definitely growing outwards though. I'm way fatter than I should be. I can blame the medication for that, it's a common side effect. Anyway, I speak too quickly. I rush through words I find uncomfortable and I'm doing that now. I need to slow down because I want to explain how my world slowed down. I also need to talk about how my life is a shape and a size and how it can be made to fit into something small like a house. But the first thing I want to say is how quiet everything got. That was the first thing I noticed. It was as though somebody had come along and turned the volumes just above mute and now everybody felt the need to talk in whispers. Not just mum and dad but people who came to visit too. Like something terrible was asleep in the corner of the room and nobody dared to be the one to wake it. I'm talking about relatives here. People like my aunties and grandparents. My parents were never the sort to have loads of friends. I had a few but they were at school. That was the other thing that happened. I think I might be rushing again but I'll just tell you quickly about how I stopped going to school because it's important and it's an actual thing that happened. Most of my life isn't anything. Most of life is just the passing of time and we're even asleep for a fair chunk of that. When I'm heavily medicated I sleep for up to 18 hours a day. During these times I'm far more interested in my dreams than in reality because they take up much more of my time. If I'm having nice dreams I can see my life to be pretty good. When the medication isn't working properly or if I decide not to take it, I spend more time awake but then my dreams have a way of following me. It's like we each have a wall that separates our dreams from reality, but mine has cracks in it. The dreams can wriggle and squeeze their way through until it's hard to know the difference. Sometimes the walls break completely. It's then the nightmares come. But now I'm getting distracted. I'm forever getting distracted. I need to concentrate because there's a lot I want to write about, like the stuff about my school. Summer was over, September was edging to a close and I still hadn't been back to the classroom. So a decision had to be made. The headmaster phoned and I listened to mum's half of the conversation from the watching stair. It wasn't much of a conversation though. Basically she just said a thank you a lot of times. Then she called me to the telephone for my turn. It was weird because I never really talked to my headmaster at school. I mean, you really only talk to your teachers. I can't say for sure that I had ever once spoken to my headmaster and now he was on the end of the telephone saying, Hello Matthew, it's Mr Rogers. Hello sir, I managed, my voice sounding very small all of a sudden. I waited for him to say something else and mum squeezed my shoulder. I've been speaking with your mum but I wanted to talk to you too. Is that okay? Yeah. I know this must be a very difficult and sad time for you. I can only imagine how hard it must be. But I didn't say anything because I didn't know what there was to say so there was a really long silence. Then I started to agree that it was hard but Mr Rogers started talking again at the same time repeating that it was sad. So we both stopped to let the other one talk and neither one of us said anything. Mum rubbed at the top of my back. I've never been any good on the phone. Matthew, I won't keep you because I know this is hard, but I wanted to tell you that everyone is thinking of you, that we miss you, and however long this takes, however long you need, you'll be welcomed back warmly, so you mustn't be afraid. And that was a strange thing for him to say because I don't think I was afraid until then. I felt a lot of things, a lot that I didn't properly understand, but not afraid. Except when he said that, I suddenly was. So I just said thank you a few times and mum gave me a weak smile that didn't reach her eyes. Do you want to speak to my mum again? I think we're done now. I just wanted to say a few words. We'll see you soon, okay? I let the phone drop into its cradle with a loud clunk. He didn't see me soon. 
I didn't go back to school for a long time, went never to that school. I don't know how these decisions were made. That's the thing when you're nine years old, you don't really get told anything. Like if you're taken out of school, nobody has to tell you why. People don't have to tell you anything. I think though, most of the things we do are driven by fear. I think mum was very frightened of losing me. I think that's what it was, but I don't want to put thoughts in your head. If you're a parent, you can stop your child from going to school and sit them at the kitchen table with a workbook instead. Just write a letter to the head and that's it. You don't even need to be a teacher, although mum, although mum was, sort of. I should tell you about my mum because you probably have never met her. She's thin and pale with cold hands. She's a broad chin that she's very self-conscious about. She sniffs the milk before she drinks it. She loves me and she's mad. That'll do for now. I say that she was sort of a teacher because once upon a time she was going to be. This was when she was trying to get pregnant but there were some complications and the doctor said she might not be able to conceive. I know this stuff without any recul regulation of being told it. I think she decided to become a teacher to give her life meaning or to distract her. I don't suppose there's much difference. So she enrolled at university and did the course. Then she got pregnant with Simon and her meaning came kicking and wailing the regular way. But she got to be my teacher. Each and every weekday after Dad had settled for work, our school day would begin. First we'd clear the t breakfast tables together, stacking plates and bowls by the sink for Mum to wash whilst I made a start on the pile of key stage exercise books. I was a clever child back then. I think that took Mum by surprise. When Simon was alive, he could be a bit of a sponge, soaking up the attention. He didn't mean to or anything, but that's what special needs do. They demand more of the things around them. I seemed to go unnoticed. But sitting at the kitchen table, Mum did notice me. It might have been easier for her if I'd been stupid. I only just thought that now as I wrote it, but it might be true. There were these tests at the end of each chapter of the case, Key Stage Science, Maths and French workbooks, and whenever I got everything right, she would go quiet for ages. If I got nearly everything right, she'd go on encouraging me and gently talking me through my mistakes. That was weird, so I started making mistakes on purpose. We never went out and we never talked about anything except schoolwork. That was strange too, because if it wasn't as if my mum acted like a teacher. Sometimes she'd kiss me on the forehead and stroke my hair or whatever. We just didn't talk about anything except what was in the books, and that's exactly how the days unfolded for a long time. I couldn't tell you exactly how long in terms of months or weeks. Imagine to one extended moment with me sitting at the kitchen table doing my tests and mum talking to me through my deliberate mistakes. That's what I mean by the world slowing down, but it is hard to explain because it only takes a couple of pages to say how it was up day after day. But it is the day after day that takes so long. When my work was done I could watch cartoons or play some Nintendo, or sometimes I'd go upstairs and gently press my, press my ear against Simon's bedroom door listening. Sometimes I'd kill a bit of time doing that. We never talk, talked about that either. Mum would make tea and we would wait for my dad to get home. I should tell you about my dad, because you've probably never met him. He's tall and broad and stoops a little. He wears a leather jacket because he used to ride a motorcycle. He calls me Mon Ami, and he loves me. That'll do for now. My father is mad. I said that, but you might not see it. I mean, you might not think that anything I've told you proves she's mad. But there are different kinds of madness. Some madness doesn't act mad to begin with, sometimes it will knock politely at the door and when you let it in it will simply sit in the corner without a fuss and grow. Then one day, maybe many months after you've decided to take your son out of school and isolate him in a house for reasons that got lost in your grief, one day that madness will stir in the chair and will say to him, you look pale. What? You look pale. You don't look well at all, sweetheart. Are you feeling okay? I'm fine, I think. I have a bit of a sore throat. Let me feel you. She put the back of her hand against my forehead. Oh darling, you feel hot. You're burning up. Really? I feel okay. You've been looking pale for a few days now. I don't think you get enough sunshine. We never go out! I said that angrily. I didn't mean to, but that's the way it came out. It wasn't fair of me either, because we did go out sometimes. I wasn't a prisoner or anything. We didn't go out much though. I never without Dad taking us. I suppose that's what I mean by saying how life can shrink into a house. I suppose I'm just ungrateful. Mum must have thought so because she suddenly looked at me like I'd spat on her or something. But then she said very sweetly, Shall we go for a walk? We could pop in to see Dr Marlow. We can look at your throat. It wasn't cold, but she took out my orange winter coat from the hook and she zipped it right to the top with the hood pulled up. Then we stepped outside. To get to the local GP surgery from my house, she had to walk past my school, or rather what used to be my school. Mum held my hand as we crossed the main road, and as we rounded the corner I could hear the distant shouts and laughter drifting over the playground. I must have resisted. I don't remember doing so on purpose, but I must have done. Because as we got closer, Mum's grip on me tightened, taking hold of my wrist and pulling me along. Let's go back, Mum! 
We didn't go back. We walked right. We walked right up to the school and along the whole length of the fence. I was practically being dragged with my stupid hood right over my eyes. So you, Matthew. Hello, Mrs. Holmes. Hello, Matthew. I can't think of her name now. Gemma or something. It doesn't matter anyway. Anyway. Hey, it's Matthew. The thing is, I was even popular. The group of children who gathered at the fence did so because they liked me. They were my classmates who would have been shaken up by what happened, and my sudden exit from their lives. But I didn't talk to them. I can't explain it. I looked straight ahead, hiding behind my hood, whilst Mum said, Matthew isn't very well today. Go back and play. Dr Marlowe asked me to open wide. He looked inside my mouth, breathing his warm breath into me, smelling of coffee. There was nothing wrong with my throat that a few lozenges and some lem sip could not fix. Okay, so that was the Sugar Before Chapter 3. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back soon um, with chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4 has 1, 2 and a half. Chapter 5 has 1, 2, 3, 4 pages. So, all together that's not a lot. But yeah, I will be doing more videos and I'll be doing reviews etc etc and upcoming books I'm excited for so I hope you enjoy and I will see you soon in my next video goodbye and keep reading